listening to episode 263 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, I'm interviewing Bob Dapper of Royal Spa. Bob has been selling hot tubs and swim spas since 1981. Later, he got into manufacturing high-quality sensory deprivation float tanks and even baptistries. So he has a whole bunch of interesting products, cold plunges. In the show, he talks about water therapy in general. We talk quite a bit about sensory deprivation floating, how it works, why it's beneficial, what to look for in a good float tank. He talks about why he prefers magnesium sulfate to magnesium chloride. I ask him about hot tubs and whether it's possible to add magnesium to your hot tub, and what makes his hot tubs different from all the rest. Bob's a firecracker and really fun to talk to. So enjoy. Here is Bob Dapper. All right, Bob Dapper, welcome to the show. Hi, it's good to be here. Yeah, we're going to talk about a, a lot of stuff. Uh, sensory deprivation floating and uh, hydrotherapy and cold plunges. Uh, the reason why I reached out to you was I was uh, promoting uh, a certain brand that sold a sensory deprivation tank and um, just found a lot of questionable stuff uh, about the the process. And but I love the the integrity of the hardware and it seemed really high quality. And so I eventually found uh, you guys over at Royal Spa. And uh, reached out, and uh, you responded, and here we are. I'm just happy to talk to the guy because you're the one that's providing these float tanks to a lot of different companies in the U.S. Is that correct? Right, and then I represent uh, the flotation industry uh, to the National Sanitation Foundation in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so, when we're talking about clarifying different things, uh, I was interesting that there are government organizations that create a procedure or a legal restriction around a product, but then can't test to that level. So they're like, well, Bob, now that we've told you that you have to change the water, the air over every five minutes, how do we actually prove that it does that? Well, how about we try it this way? Well, that would be good. You're like, you mean you don't know how? And so, so having started in business in 1981, which was before a lot of your listeners were alive, uh, I wanted to figure out what I was supposed to do. I was in engineering school. I'm a mechanical engineer. And when the prof would hand back my test, because my mom is an English professor, I would correct the grammar on his test and hand them back to him and say, three of the questions that you told me are wrong are actually right because the way you form the question is inappropriate and it was confusing. So you have to throw the questions out. So he would only take that for so long. So finally he said, what do you expect to do when you get out of college? And I said, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And he said, good, because you're way too weird to sit behind a desk for the rest of your life. So after the class, uh, one of my uh, friends came up to me and he said, I would like to be in business too. And what would you like to do? And I said, well, I said, we can't do, I don't know, because that doesn't pay very well. And he said, my dad owns a building that there's a fiberglass company operating out of, and we could throw them out of that building and we can do a business in there. And he said, why don't we come up with fun things that are made out of fiberglass and we can finish them and I will sell them. He said, can you sell? And he said, and I said, yes, I can. And so that was close to 73,000 hot tubs ago. And so, uh, so I was making the hot tubs which lent itself into making small hot tubs, which are whirlpool baths. And then I was making hot tub cabinets, which lent themselves towards making saunas. And then I was making hot tubs, which lent themselves to making swim spas. And so all of those products started to push and pull. And so, so as you make the swim spas, you run into a person like Endless Pool, who was advertising in the airline magazines. And they said, hey, we make a really expensive version of it. Can you make ours? And I said, well, sure I can. But because there's some new regulations that came out from the government, they were not in compliance with some of the intake regulations. So you might have heard of Virginia Graham Baker, where the kids were getting sucked to the intakes and drowned in swimming pools. It was pulling their hair and it was waking it where it was sucking their insides out. And that was 
embarrassing to the pool industry. So they came out with this regulation for how the intakes had to be made. So then they had to be three feet apart. They had to be capable of handling 100% of the flow of the pump. And then the filter was only allowed to pass water through it at such and such a rate. And it became more and more and more of a mathematical problem, which falls right into the lap of an engineer. Because we're like, hey, we get to have big fun now because we can turn all the math against the governmental agencies and say, here's the only thing that can be made now that you've made all of your rules. So, so the float industry came along as uh, companies that weren't doing their intakes right kind of fell, fell away. Uh, Endless Pool kind of croaked, and then they were picked up again by another company, and the name was resurrected, but the original owners were gone. And so, so we weren't conducting ourselves with that group. And so along comes this guy named Joe Rogan. And Joe Rogan is a nice guy. He's a super nice man. And so I was wandering through the uh, casino at Mandalay Bay and said, Joe, what are you doing? He says, well, we're filming Fear Factor from here. He said, have you ever been on TV before? And I said, well, I have. And he says, well, would you mind helping me? We need to find extras to stand behind the shots uh, for to block logos of companies that don't sponsor the show. I said, Sure. So we were up all night finding people to stand behind the shot and, and set it up. And Joe goes, what do you do? I said, well, I make hot tubs and saunas and swim spas. He goes, dude, dude, you've got to make these flotation tanks. They are the bomb. And so, so I'm like, whatever, Joe. And so he gave my card to someone from the military. And the next thing you know, I'm making $4 million worth of float tanks for the United States military. So could be worse. You know, there's worse things that could happen. And so so we're muttering along and, and I'm having a, a, the communication with them. I go and visit a friend of mine who's a congressman in Washington, D.C., and I get a million dollar contract to make the baptismal tanks for the United States military chaplain service. So now I've got this direct inroad to help people with post-traumatic stress disorder um, and with even religious issues that are in the military. And so I was like, well, this is a very interesting coincidence the way things are, are playing out. So, so you start in the industry looking at what everyone else does and see, okay, oh, there's a guy over in Great Britain and there's a guy on the East Coast, there's a guy on the West Coast and there's some Asian products that are coming in. And, you know, when you get into a certain product, the instinct is to do R&D. You ever heard of R&D? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that means research and duplicate. Doesn't mean research and development. <laughs> it means research and duplicate. And so you figure, well, can we make exactly what this guy does? And so then you start asking his customers how happy they are. And they go, well, the tank overheats at night and we have to wait until lunch for it to cool off. Mm-hmm. Well, does that mean he has the wrong heater? Or does that re- means he has the wrong pump? And it actually means the overheating is done by the pump not by the heater. Oh. And isn't that counterintuitive? Well, it seems like the heater would be the problem. The heater never came on and it still was 10 degrees hotter the next day because when you put motion into water, it stops due to friction. And we know that friction oh. is heat. Wow. Interesting. And now the motor is rubbing this high molecular weight solution on the inside of the piping and it's overheating due to just that friction overnight. So now you've got 2,000 pounds of salt water that is super hot. And it's not like water that you just blow on and it cools off. No, this is, this is now like one of those super expensive coolers because they put Epsom salts in those really high-end coolers because there's something called a latent heat coefficient, where that's the amount of energy between phases. You know that if you put an ice cube on the stove, you've got to heat it a certain amount to make it go to water. And then you have to put a lot more heat in it into it to make it go into steam. Well, same thing with salt water. So salt water takes a tremendous amount of energy to change it from one phase to another. So that's why when you float in Epsom salts, it transfers energy into you in a most interesting fashion. It doesn't burn you, but because it's a low, dull heat at a lower frequency than the heat usually attracts to you, you don't burn, but you become energized by that heat. And so it's a most interesting thing because you know that different sauna configurations, the heaters strike you at a different wavelength and sometimes they burn and do nothing for you because we call those 
toaster ovens. And then the ones that have the right frequency actually pass deep enough into you to influence your circulation in order to enhance enhance oxygen de- uh, delivery to different systems and allow your endorphins to experience this warm, a totally with, I mean, totally in tune with the reality, you know? And so, so it's all about the frequency of which you engage life. You know that people, you can walk up to a person and tell you can't like that person because they're vibrating at a different frequency than you are. That's the mean person that you hide from all through grade school. And then, then you've got kind people that you meet and they're waiting on your restaurant. And you could tell you could be best of friends with them for decades. It's because you can sense the way that they engage life. So, so a float tank can be similar to that experience because you're able to engage your own thoughts on your own terms in a temperature that's less than 95 degrees. So there's the first tripwire. The first tripwire in the float industry is the temperature 95. In the, ex- in the event that you exceed 95 degrees, there are people that will have seizures from having their head below the water at that temperature. In a hot tub, because your chest and your head is above the water, you can go to uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission says 104, but you see people poaching themselves in the hotel hot tub at 106 and 110. But because their skull is not submerged, they're not prone to a stroke. But what happens in a hot tub that makes people p- feel nauseous is that the energy right below their rib cage is your diaphragm. And when you relax a person's cardiovascular system and you relax their circulatory system, they just feel relaxed. If you relax their diaphragm, their upper guts ooze onto their lower guts and they feel like they're going to barf in the hot tub. And so that's why they tell you not to go over 104 in a hot tub and not to go over 95 in a flotation tank. So, so at night at 94.1, you're, you're, you're straddling the girl temperature and the boy temperature girls, because they're more hormonal, like the temperature in most cases at 93.5, a man, because he's kind of wimpy when it comes to cold, uh, he likes 94.5. So we balance the float tanks at 94.1. So the guy's a little cold and the girl's a little warm and they work it out in their own brain. And so so the, uh, so the that 94.1 allows you to not be able to tell where you are because you're trying to make your body not know where your skin stops and where the solution continues because you're taking away the sense of touch. So the more senses we shut down, theoretically, the more bored your brain becomes. Boredom in your brain is what causes it to access your DNA and look at how you're supposed to be structured. You know, if you've got a a tendon that's blown out or you've got a muscle that's twisted or you've got some type of issue in your body, your brain just has to have a chance to look over there and go, hey, that ain't right. We got to get over there. And so so the reason why we all have friends, even our in our 40s that die of cancer, is that the brain never sees that that cancer is there. The cancerous cells have a sugar or a sucrose type of condition. So, you know, you've got sugar in your diet. So your pancreas has tons of sugar. Your belly's got tons of sugar. So having a cellular condition that is high in sucrose or high in sugar isn't abnormal to your brain. But you've also got sodium uh, signatures on some of your tissues. All right. So salt and sugar. All right. Still no way of telling the health of a cell by the brain. So now you introduce magnesium into your hot tub. You you introduce magnesium into your float tank. You've got, basically in my hot tubs, I will introduce 20 pounds of Epsom salts in order to allow the body to absorb it. And then I wipe it on my feet and I put it across my medulla and across my shoulder blades while I'm in the hot tub. That drives it into your central cortex as far as being able to absorb the maximum amount of magnesium sulfate. Now, the reason why we like the word magnesium sulfate better than magnesium oxide, even though you can absorb magnesium oxide three times faster on the magnesium side, we really need the sulfates to set the table. So a lot of people are like, what is this guy talking about? Were you referring to, because we talked about chloride, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, chloride versus sulfate. Is that what you're referring to? I am. So when we talk about magnesium chloride, magnesium chloride can come directly from the earth and it can be mined. Whereas magnesium oxide comes out of Wyoming, comes in train car loads to North Carolina. Then the 
train carloads of magnesium oxide are exposed to sulfuric acid, and that turns it into magnesium sulfate. So the magnesium sulfate, when dissolved around a human, when it gets to a certain size, it's able to pass the sulfates through the dermis, which is your largest organ. It comes in through your skin and enters into your bloodstream. And the fourth best thing that it does is it cleans out your lymphatic glands. So you know that the lymphatic system has the filters for your blood. So when you clean out filters, they pass the solutions more efficiently and more effectively. So now you can bring oxygen to your tissues more efficiently because there isn't something in your armpit that's blocking it from getting to the end of your arm. So uh, I used to have a, a girlfriend that made me macaroni and cheese, and I think it clogged my lymphatic system because my arms went numb, but that's a totally different subject. <laughs> but, but the sulfates coming in will make contact with your lymphatic system, and it makes the stuff in your lymphatic system globulize, meaning it releases, but it stays in these little clods, which get caught by your kidneys. And so the detox that comes in a humanoid when using a float tank is when you urinate after you get out of the float tank. So nobody is letting goo through their skin into the tanks. So that's the first thing that we're going to be talking about when we talk about clarifying and purifying flotation tanks. So so, so now we've got all this stuff that's flushed out of our uh, lymphatic system. That's the fourth best thing. The third best thing is even cooler, where the sulfates make contact with the uh, plaque cholesterol in our bloodstream. Now, we've all seen enough TV to know that plaque cholesterol buildup in our plumbing is called cardiovascular disease. And it seems like a bad idea overall. So you wouldn't really draw that card if you didn't have to. So if the sulfates make contact with that plaque cholesterol, it allows it to convert to cholesterol sulfate. And cholesterol sulfate is an essential brain nutrient. So now you went from having cardiovascular disease to having boatloads of brain food. Seems like a good trade. But that's only the third best thing that's all, that uh, magnesium sulfate does for you. The second best thing is really interesting. The magnesium comes in, and we've all seen the little picture of our uh, the nerve ends that we have, the synapses, and how they get further and further away as we get older and our electrical system gets frazzled. Well, because of the magnesium enrichment of that system, it allows your nervous system to grow back and make a much better contact of your synaptic membranes, and then you can feel your toes like you haven't been able to since you were 19, or your fingers that that feel numb as you turn 60 and 70 years old. So that becomes wow. kind of a cool deal. Question? <laughs> and that's not even going into the benefits of magnesium itself, which I got into, I don't know, 2011, 2012, the benefits of, and I was making my own magnesium bicarbonate and doing foot baths and stuff. But magnesium alone, just that mineral has like thousands of benefits, right? That's right. And that, <laughs> but, but my favorite one is where the magnesium goes in through your skin and enters the blood system. And then your cellular structure adopts that as the leading signature of that cell. So only mm-hmm. a healthy cell in the human body can absorb magnesium and make that its signature element. So now the body knows that only a healthy cell can have magnesium in it. So the minute that it sees that that's a healthy cell, it will move on to the non-magnesium enriched cells and assume that those are unhealthy. So that's your cancers and your cartilage that is damaged. And it's all the different cellular components, you know, including, you know, you get a big scar. It can get rid of that tissue because that can never become a normal cellular structure. So wow. you see people really improve on their own health condition because the body can find the stuff that's inappropriate. Wow. So there's a lot that you said there. Yeah, I was making notes. And the temperature is fascinating because I was taught when I got into float tanks and uh, that it was supposed to be equivalent to your skin temperature, which right. it's not 98.6, right? Is it a little that's less? your core temperature. 98.6 is... But 94 is considered to be a normal human skin temperature. Oh, okay. 94. Right. But then you say, okay, now you're going to sling this whole product at the National Sanitation Foundation, a government entity that's going to tell you how to run it and how to make it safe. Okay, here it comes. So now they say, well, you know, at 95, there are some people that have a seizure. So we'd really not like you to go over 95. And then we've got these 
filters that go on commercial swimming pools. And we don't really want there to be more than 0.375 gallons of water per square foot of element going through per minute on a float tank. And then we want you to use two active purification mechanisms. So that might be ozone, that may be a chlorinator, that may, it might be a brominator, it might be a UV device. And so now you're starting to turn this into this giant math problem on how big does the filter really have to be? And so, so the standalone filters put people out of business because their float center can't afford to buy a $175 filter every 50 floats. So, okay, how do we do that? Well, I took a filter that was the appropriate size for the 180 gallons of solution. Keep in mind, the people that do codes for commercial swimming pools are looking at 180,000 gallons of water in a commercial pool with 400 dirty butts in it all day, every day. And they're going to tell you how many times it's got to be turned over in order to put chlorine into it. So you're like, well, that's not really fair. I have six pounds of Epsom salts per gallon of water. I only have 180 gallons of solution, and I only got one butt, which showered before they got in. So this is not fair for you to put me in that same category, but they try. And so, yeah. so, so there is Washington State, there is North Carolina, there's Florida, and there is uh, Rhode Island. They all have their own standards. So if you're going into one of those states, you have to read their book, not anybody else's book, to figure out what's allowed to go in there. So we have five different float tanks that we have to make seven different ways in order to accommodate state code. Wow. And there's a difference with like a, like a public use of flotation tanks versus home use. And uh, I only did a few public floats before I bought my own because I was sold on the on the benefits Um but as far as showering before and after, is it the same if it's only you and your significant other using it versus a public? Or is there any difference there on well, protocol? Well, you think about it. You think about it. You're in a cold weather state right now. And so the oil that's on your body is kind of sludgy because any discus oil like that would be sludgy and harder to penetrate if you tried to float. So what we talk about with people is if, if you're in a colder state and you're coming in and it's less than 50 degrees outside, it would really help to wash the oils at, with warm water off of your torso. So you've got a better chance of getting the maximum benefit of absorption from the $70 float you just paid for. You know, it's kind of wear, like wearing a wetsuit into a float tank. You know, you'd get the floaty benefit, but there wouldn't be a single biochemical experience that you would have anything to say was of value. Okay, so, makes sense. So that's what it's about. So the, the but the, the backside of floating is hilarious. We may or may not have heard, all the girls have heard of these European body wraps where you can get a European body wrap with Epsom salts and rags and they put them all over this girl and when she gets out, she can get into her prom dress from high school regardless of how old she is. Well, if you don't take a shower after you get out of a float tank, you cannot take a full breath. Your skin shrinks down so tightly around you, you're like, whoa, and it starts to freak you out. Like the first time you glue your fingers together with super glue, you know you can get them apart, but it still makes you insane. <laughs> and so 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 the so the the Epsom salts needs to be washed off on the backside just because it will freak you out when you're crushed by your own torso <laughs> or your own your own dermal layer. But uh I had that happen. I took a cell phone call while I was floating. And I was standing on one foot talking on the cell phone and it went into extra innings. And I was like, whoa, I can't, I can't take a whole breath. And so <laughs> that was interesting. But, that's, uh, that's funny. Yeah. Well, it, well, it's funny you mentioned way, way back about the pump heating up the water often more so than the heater because I have a system currently here I was telling you about. And since we're 100% off grid, I mostly pulse it. Like if I'm running the generator, I'll run the run the circulating pump, but right. I just keep it off for months often. And I'll just dose a little bit of 35% hydrogen peroxide intermittently. But um, yeah, I noticed it heats up like crazy, uh, like close to a hundred degrees when I run it after it's been sitting and it's in a, and you know, it's staying above freezing. So it's hydronic right. floor heat, but yeah, it heats yeah, up just know a lot. That, that, that's frictional and that yeah. there's just such a heat sink there that it holds tons of water. Well, yeah. but the, now that leads us perfectly into the purification of your tank or mine. Mine circulates all day, every day, except when someone's floating it. 
and yours doesn't have to. But when you turn the solution off and it drops below 87.5 degrees, it starts to dissipate. It'll sink to the bottom. It will clog some of the pipes. It will stop the propeller from turning into your pump. And so Epsom salts has an interesting personality about trying to turn back into a salt crystal when it drops below a certain temperature. So that's why I keep it circulated and I keep it warm. But, you know, your average customer says, well, you know, I don't know if I want to get in to a float tank after some naked person's gotten out. That seems yucky. You go, well, that's a totally legitimate concept. But let's look at what happens to the cootie. Do you have cooties where you live? Because we all had cooties back in kindergarten. That was a very important thing to avoid. And so, so when you've got this bacterial component or a cootie, as we call it, and it makes its way into a float tank. A float tank is 42% saline. Now, the poultry industry will tell you that above 22%, nothing can exist in the solution. So there isn't any pathogen. There's no bacteria. There's no virus. There's no nothing that can be in that tank. And is it because the Dead Sea is poisonous? Is it because the salt has some kind of you know, acid base to it? No, it's because when we talk about specific gravity, most of us just rolled our eyes in chemistry class back in the day. But when you make the, the weight of the water so significant that you only float this deep in it at 180 or 190 pounds, okay, that means that the solution is so buoyant that no cootie has enough weight to sink in the solution. So we know that there are living organiz- organisms that have a specific gravity of 18% more than water meaning 1.18. So what do those people or what do those critters exist as? They can sink themselves in the ocean to a thousand feet below the surface and live there. Now it's only 34 degrees. I don't know why anything would choose to go there, but you know, it's their own deal. And so, but those guys being 1.19 sink much deeper than you would because your specific gravity is 1.09. It means if you hold your breath, you float. If you exhale, you sink. So that's why we're all kind of neutral and ballast when it comes to swimming. But when we look at the salt in these salt tanks, I can, I'm 189 pounds. I can almost sit completely up in my rear end. It's still not making contact with the bottom. So it's that buoyant where you can do all kinds of ab exercises in a float tank. I'm kind of a personality. Can't necessarily lay in a float tank. It just, you know, I have to do something. But uh, yoga, yoga in a float tank is really good. You can really... <laughs> really get some of the hinges we're rolling but uh the so it is impossible for anything to live beneath the surface so there's nothing in there Mm -hmm. and plus there's seven hundred dollars worth of salt in that tank and it would be completely inappropriate to dump 700 bucks worth of salt every time a person floats in your float tank because you'd be charging them thousand dollars or fourteen hundred dollars for a one hour float i don't think we'd have very many customers so, but, you, but you use ultraviolet, right? Because there's a couple methods and in intermittent 35% hydrogen peroxide. Oh, sure. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. Well, let's talk about that. We talk about bio biomass and talk mm-hmm. about that kind of stuff. Those are big words that people use for their dead stuff in there. And so I like to talk to the blue collar people. And so, so the when you look at this solution, if a person's laying in the float tank and we'll have something that you can really visualize, you have a cold, you sneeze directly into the air. So the snot goes straight up and straight back down. <laughs> so, so now there's snot on your face there's snot, and it's floating around. You're like, oh my God, I would never want to get in that water again. Well, so now the cooties that are in that sneeze landed either on the side of the tank and on the surface of the tank, or it landed on the surface of the water. So the surface of the tank, we're going to wipe down with, some degree of frequency with like a Clorox wipe or, or something like that because it's warm and it's wet and it's dark. And so that's where the fuzzies would go, but they're not going to jump off of the wall on you. But the, the guys that are in the water, mathematically, by code, we're supposed to suck all of the water in the tank through the skimmers, into the pump, through the heater, through the UV device, into an ozonated chamber, which turns them with ozone gas and then blows them back into the tank and then does it to them four more or three more times before the next customer gets in. So now 
The ozone is O3. You remember from high school chemistry that oxygen likes to, to be O2. So the O3 touches the water, it, the, it loses an ion of oxygen. The ion of oxygen goes and attaches to a cootie and it makes the cootie die of old age. That's how ozone kills things. So it kills mold spores. And you know, when you've got a bad smell in a room, you can put an ozonator in there. It just makes all of the fuzzies die of old age. So that's pretty straightforward. So that's why there are the little bubbles that shoot out of the jets of a float tank, because that's just ozone. But the ozone pools a little bit when you're not using it. And so that would kill any kind of mold or anything that was near the water line. So, so then you've got your squeegeers. So your basic squeegeer, is the person that extends their hand like this. And when they get out of the float tank, goes like this. And so they do that on themselves. So a squeegeer, he just deposited dead skin, dead cooties and hair into your float tank. Thanks a lot. He thinks he's helping you though, because it seemed like a lot of solution to hang on him when he's coming out of the float. So that is your biomass. So it starts floating on the surface because it can't sink. So it heads across and hits the skimmers. The skimmers pick up the hair because there's, little baskets inside there. So the ozone gas is in that water. It'll make sure the hairs don't have any fuzzies on it. So in goes this body oil, in goes this dead skin, and the bulk of it will be caught by the filter. Some of it will be so molecularly small that it will dart around the filter because you can never crush the filter quite tight enough not to give it a couple of holes to sneak through. So that will end up as a little beige ring around the collar. So that's where we spray the hydrogen peroxide around the perimeter to eat all of that biomass from inside the tank. And then we put some hydrogen peroxide by the intakes. And that hydrogen peroxide takes an organic component of a humanoid or anything and converts it from what it is to an inorganic dust like calcium dust or chalk, you know it to be, or and oxygen. So that's why hydrogen peroxide boils on anything organic that it touches. So that's why we will... At, as needed, put hydrogen peroxide into a float tank. It is not necessary to keep it year-round in there. So what does the, uh, the UV device do? The UV device is an antiviral component that became really popular during this recent, uh, this recent occurrence known as COVID, which me, I just drank a bunch of moonshine and I was fine. But others got really sick from it. And so I called moonshine anti-COVID elixir. <laughs> Comes from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, very well known area, but uh, and my end of the country. So, so the thing was that the saline component. Uh, they say that it only takes four grains of salt to kill the flu. It only takes one grain of salt to kill COVID. And so, because they couldn't put that on paper and certify it, they made everybody put these between 15 watt and 55 watt UV devices on there. So. Anything that represented a, you know, how they always tell you when you've got the, a cold that you'll get over it, but they can't give you anything if you've got a virus. Well, a UV device is antiviral. So regardless of the virus, a UV impact from a high energy photon will kill him. So that's what we're using that. So on the national code, it says you have to have two active purification methods. We don't want to put a UV device or an ozonator, or no, we don't want to put a, an oz- a, a, a chlorinator or brominator on there. Those are called, uh, you know, when you put in something like that, like chlorine has chloramines, which smell a lot, and bromine has bromines, and both of those are kind of outlawed by the, what, which one would that be? It was the EPA. So the EPA mm-hmm. says you can't use it, and then... The swimming pool guys say you have to use it. So it's a push me pull you right now. It's one of those llamas going both directions. <laughs> and so, so that's why we try not to use any chlorine or bromine in it because nothing that chlorine or bromine would kill is alive in salt water. And they're just doing it because when you look at some of these states, they're reading out of a 1978 universal swimming pool code that has worked just fine up till now. Well, back then you didn't have a float tank. And so it does, it's not applicable. So that's why almost every state, except for the five that I mentioned, are pretty much ignoring the float industry because no one is sickened by salt water and they just leave it alone. Do, do you think there's long term benefits of floating, even if someone stops? Because that's been my experience. Like, I, I want to get back into it, but I've floated probably dozens of times, like, a, like probably two years ago. 
And I feel like I'm still experiencing the effects. It felt like a, a reset in life, you know, of all the stressors. And it just felt like, you know, clearing the slate. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on the long-term effects we of floating? We ask how long the saturation of magnesium in your tissues would last because the body completely rebuilds itself in seven years. Okay. How long did it take for the magnesium that you absorbed in yeah. your seven plus floats? last in your system because it could last for months it could last for years but i really like to give myself the best chance possible when it comes to something trying to make me sick <laughs> that's awesome how often do you float just out of curiosity well i have a, a float tank in my basement and uh so i go down there and it's the most interesting thing because i'm more about from an engineering standpoint how much of me do i have to float in order to get the benefit so if I go down and I just sit in my float tank and I do all my leads and I catch up on my emails and all that, where where does that benefit me compared to a full laying out, trying to sleep kind of deal? And so I found that it's very interesting. You can stand in a float tank for 45 minutes because I used to stand in them and caulk the seam around the top for the pods. Uh, and I would uh, recognize an extraordinary benefit from the sulfates coming up to my uh, rib cage, just to the base of my rib cage. And so from there down, I was like, whoa, I felt like a spaceman, you know, because I felt super light and things. And so, so I do believe that if you can get your tailbone, remember that, uh, did you ever see the movie with James Bond, that uh, golden, the man with the golden gun? Uh-huh. But you have to keep you can't paint an entire human. Yeah, you can't paint your lower back because there is absorption of nutrients and oxygen through your lower back that is significant to keeping you alive. So if you're floating up to your navel and you're doing leads and doing stuff like that, I am in that at least three times a week just doing that. And then I'll float just to goof off because um, as men get older, our quads get tighter. And that's what makes you get a gut because if you keep your quads pulled back then your belly won't stick out. And so, because your quads pull your hips down and tip them. And so it's a really big deal to stretch your quads. So you could reach behind you and grab under your foot and be pulling your quads out while you're floating. And so that's kind of a, a yoga thing. I had to teach a yoga class one time because the yoga teacher didn't speak English. So I had to demonstrate for the Americans <laughs> what she's trying to say. But <laughs> so, so you pick up bits and pieces all over the place like that. Well. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting that that just sitting or standing in it. Uh, I've never, I, I've always just gone full meditation mode in it, and I find just from the sensory overload of life, that's like my favorite benefit of floating. It's just shutting See, out the world. You're talented enough to know how to meditate. I am an engineer. We're constantly working on some mathematical equation, and so with me, the biochemical thing is my big thrust. I want all the biochemical value that I can get, and then if I get a chance to relax, if I get a chance to chill out, if I get these are all like icing on the cake. But but when you own as many businesses as I do, you've always got some fire that you're trying to figure out how to put out. Makes sense. <laughs> And I wanted to talk about the pod versus the the pool design because I think most people are probably more familiar with um, the pod design at flotation spas, um, whereas the pool. I think we were talking about it before. You were saying that's designed or was designed for couples to float together, like if men have extreme PTSD right. or something going on, they could not float alone. Right. Well. When you look at the original float tanks, you know, they look like burial vaults. And so there was this 45 degree door on the end. You're supposed to climb in and people go, well, I really don't want to be one of those in- unless I'm forced to by death. And so you're like, well, I think we could redesign that. So Isopod in Great Britain designed this thing that looked like the the spaceship from Mork and Mindy uh, from back in the day. And so they started designing it like that. And that became so- something that kind of pulled the industry to that direction because a the, the barrel vault box was just scary to people. So you got to get over psychological triggers. So you go, okay, will you get into this egg? Oh, I'd get into that. And then, then you'd have to teach people how to put their towel in the door so that they could see out. They thought they were going to be claustrophobic. If you put your towel in the door, see, you can still, there's that little fresh air blowing on your face. Oh yeah, I like that. That's a lot better. Yeah, that's good. And so, so then you saw the people that 
had to have the parity. The difference, uh, if you have an 80 degree room and you've got a 94 degree butt, then you can tell that difference. It's too significant. And so it becomes distracting to have a cold tummy and a warm butt. So closing the tank became mandatory in order to drive the temperature to 94 above you. Well, then people felt like the air was too heavy because the relative humidity was in their, you know, 97% range. And they're like, I can't breathe. But in most cases, it was psychosomatic. It had nothing to do with their ability to discern oxygen. They just said, decide, I'm going to flip out now. And there are people that would decide to flip out in the lobby and they hadn't even seen the tank yet. Like, okay, you crazy. And so, so when we started saying, okay, what, what's wrong with the industry? Well, the people that opened, fl- opened the door, they were too cold. The people that had cabins that had the gigantic door that opened, well, that's a nice big room, but the door was so large that you lost so much of the room's heat that it would take 15 or 20 minutes to restore the air temperature above your tummy to 94 degrees that people only got half of their float time in the proper temperature configuration. So we came out with a big infrared heater that's two foot by four foot that fastens the ceiling. So it irradiates your tummy. So your tummy thinks it's 95 and your butt is 95. And so now you can relax and have the same temperature top and bottom, and but the air quality never changes. And so it's nice, lighter air. You can't convince yourself while you're in there they can't breathe. Oh my God. Because, and, and we luck out because when the person takes their shower in the room with the tank, that drives the, temp, the the relative humidity up. So she orients to that heavier air while she's showering. So when she steps out into the same room that the tank is in, she has oriented herself to that air density. Then we put a plant, you put a plant in the corner and people associate the plant with the higher level of moisture there. Oh, there's just a plant. Oh, it's the plant's fault. That's fine. I can live with the plant. <laughs> And so it is, there's a lot of psycho, psychosomatic trigger. But when you look at the cost of an open float room, it's $6,000 cheaper than a pot. So now you're trying to control your startup costs if you're going to open a float center or if you're going to put one at your house or we're an NFL player. And when we lay down, we take over the entire planet. And uh, so they need a larger tank for that application. And you could glass it in like we show on our website, but glassing it in just restricts the person's ability to move around. So the glass was used so that it would force you to go into the shower and the glass was open to the tank. So you'd get into the tank and out of the tank into the shower. So you never were prancing around the place dripping with salt because that creates a pretty substantial maintenance issue. If you're dripping on your carpet, the carpet becomes these shards of razor sharp points that you have to completely bathe in scalding hot water and then wet back it to get it out of the carpet. So that's for your residential applications. So yeah, been- do you have a lot of people buying these just for high, like high performance entrepreneurs that just, cause I see people, you know, getting like, I have some crazy technology here, like hyperbaric two atmosphere chamber and uh a halo therapy, you know, to breathe salt, but of all the therapies, to me, the mental aspect of just being able to, like like the sensory deprivation, I would still put at my top of all the potential therapies you can get for home use. Right. Well, the, the having one at home is wacky because people think that because they change the solution in short intervals at commercial places that you have to, the salt will last 2,500 floats. That might be 19 years for you. And so it's fine. It's salt and water. And God doesn't change the water in the ocean, except they evaporate some, put some more back in, you know? And so so you can actually look for divine intervention and explaining how that could be done. But as long as the pump is circulating, then everything is fine. If the pump quits circulating, so does the heat. Now you're getting a big chunk of salt here in about a month that you're not going to like. So so the the having one at home is so unbelievably simple because you can ignore it for four months and walk back to it and get in. And people don't even think of it like that because a hot tub, if you ignore it for four months, it kind of pulls you in because God only knows what grew in it. But that was just water being left alone. The, you know, so that's why we put Epsom salts in our hot tubs too, because then you can ignore that too. My hot tub in Florida sits in until from April through October all by itself. Come back, open, stop, get in. Because inherently... Oh. Salt inhibits the growth of, of bacteria. So if you put salt into something, 
and you know you don't mind the taste and i'm not drinking the hot tub water yeah. and so so these are the kind of things that people don't consider so so when you talk about the halo therapy for instance halo therapy is where a little grinder grinds up this himalayan salt which comes from pittsburgh um, and they blow it in with you <laughs> it, you know himalayan salt comes from pennsylvania and, and then it comes from afghanistan and someplace else uh, there's very little of it that comes from himalaya because i asked one lady if it was mined by the uh, abominable snowman and I, I said yeti and she said, I think it was. <laughs> I just use the white I just use the white salt because I know oh, the yeah, like yeah. the color tends to have iron and other stuff in it, right? It does. That's yeah. right. There's a lot of particulates on the floor <laughs> that are hard to handle when you get into the pink stuff. Because there's a pool about that big in the middle of a float tank where if you start adding other stuff, it kind of falls out and ends up in a circle in the middle. And that brings us back to that magnesium chloride that we talked about. Magnesium chloride is a very interesting product in that it's sold in flakes. And so it apparently is shaved by some device into these little little lobes, these little flakes. You think, well, that seems nice. But with Epsom salts, you can grind it between your hands, and then you can slather it onto your neck and put it on your feet or, or just run it into your hot tub. With magnesium oxide uh, you, or magnesium chloride, they come in these flakes and you start to rub it on somebody's shoulders and they become razor sharp shards <laughs> that try and slice your hand open and they're back. So you don't get a whole lot of brownie points rubbing that on your significant other because <laughs> you carve them like a turkey. <laughs> yeah, That needs to be pre-dissolved and in a, in a different solution and then entered into the, into the tank as an yeah. accessory. Do not rub that on anybody. <laughs> well, we, we have a... What? Sorry, go ahead. Okay. some experience. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. No, I, I get it. We have a wood burning hot tub where you just load it with firewood and then it like uh so there's like Sparkles, two holes. Yeah. That's so, right. It's convective heating, right? So convection you, is certainly valuable. Have you ever sold those or used those or have thoughts? Because I'm I'm scared of putting salt in because I don't want to corrode anything in that. Oh one, no, but, no, no, no. This you know? so keep okay. my magnesium sulfate does not oxidize anything because uh, sodium chloride has the word chlorine in it. So you can hear that chlorine will oxidize stuff. Magnesium chloride will make things rust. Magnesium sulfate only builds up on things and warm water will wash it off of anything. So the uh only thing that makes magnesium sulfate questionable for certain applications is that when a person puts a circuit board on your hot tub or your float tank, the, the dust off of that salt will corrode that, not corrode, it will say contaminate the circuit board because the circuit board is electrostatic so the dust goes in and starts bridging between electrical circuits that you didn't want to be touching so it becomes haunted so your tank comes on all by itself and goes off by itself and the music goes on and off light goes on and off yeah so your snorkel device you could put at least 20 pounds of magnesium um, sulfate into that without any fear of any corrosion wow I'm going to try it. That's that's exciting. <laughs> well, keep in mind that your technology existed when the hot tubs were barrels. So you're right. 76, 78, 80, right in there before the acrylic hot tubs started coming out. You can't put that warm water into a fiberglass vessel for any length of time because the gel coat blisters up. The customer wants you dead. So, so angry customers are more and more angry in today's world. So you only do what's right. So- so then you looked at acrylics and acrylics because they used a regular polyester resin would have a material in it that would expand for moisture. So where they stretch the plastic really tight, moisture could permeate those corners and make blisters all over the tank. So that's how the hot tub industry moved in to the plastics and the acrylics with lots of headaches in between. But the your snorkel on a hot tub was done 60 years ago. So That's incredible. Wow. It's a, it's a proven technology. It's just hard to slow it down because you know that a log is giving up all the energy of the tree that the sun put into it over the tree's life. So there is a ton of energy in that log. Wow. I notice it's with those wood burning hot tubs. They look cool, but it's it's a learning experience to because I've got it up to 105 and I'm like, oh, well, I, now I wait an hour or so for it to cool down. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. There is a ton of energy in there. And so that's why people have to sometimes have a way of taking it into a separate barrel when the tank is up to temperature 
so that that energy dissipates into the barrel instead of dissipating into the tank. Because you will notice it raced right past your favorite temperature and kept on going. (laughs) And so that is interesting. And so I teach people about that type of physics because I am on an IndyCar race team. So you've seen the Indianapolis 500 before. And if you put a gallon of gasoline into a race car, it'll go 25 miles, but uh, it has a problem with wearing the tires out. So the gas goes further than tire lasts. If you put methanol into it, it'll only go 15 miles, but now it goes two laps too far. The guy still ends up dying because he tries to drive until he runs out of fuel instead of the tires. So now with ethanol, which can only get the amount of energy that the corn received or the sugar cane received in one summer in the field, that's all the energy that's available. The car runs out of fuel before the tires go away and the guy doesn't die trying to get that extra lap out of tires that are spent. And so I teach everybody that all of race cars, all the race cars at Indy run on sunshine. And so, so does your hot tub because sunshine is locked in those trees. That's really cool. And, and uh, I wanted to touch on just m- maybe briefly or for a few minutes, uh, cold plunging. And now that I live in a cold climate, it's funny. I mostly crave just sauna and hot tub. <laughs> but yeah. when I was living in the desert, we craved the cold plunge and it was great on a really hot, you know, 90 degree day or something. Well, you know, the Europeans have been doing the cold plunge since the yeah. 1500s. And so they were really into it. So I was at dinner the other night with this person from um, Holland, which uh, is the Netherlands. And uh, one of these guys that does these cold plunges over there had himself injected with it, E. coli bacteria because he <laughs> believed that the amount of ability for him to fight disease from him getting into these cold plunges allowed him to have no impact. And he did not have a single fever. He did not have a single symptom from being injected with E. coli. Wim, Wim Hof, right? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. 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 That's it. He's crazy. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah. So he was bragging about that. And this girl was so enamored by that. I was like, I don't know about that. But <laughs> the guy that inv- invented the GFI, the ground fault interrupter that we all have in our kitchens and our bathrooms now, he put his kid in a bathtub and threw a uh, hair dryer in with his kid to prove that his GFI worked. Yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And people still respect him to this day. I think that guy's a moron. I mean, what's, you know, I saw your cat go by. I think the cat would be. <laughs> <laughs> That's like. That's right. So, so like the, cold, the cold plunges you sell, is it pretty much the reverse of a hot tub instead of a no. heater you're using a chiller? Or it's totally you know, different? you got to remember that where you are right now, you've got your foosball players. You ever seen the movie uh, Waterboy where yeah. foosball is the devil? Well, these people are taking these cold plunges and putting them outside, and then it drops to nine below zero. And when you have a cold plunge that start out at 38 or even 40, and the temperature outside where the tank is sitting drops below freezing, there's no way in normal cases of protecting that tank against this solution freezing. So now you've got this frozen tank, which bursts the side of the of the device itself because you've got these chillers underneath there and the chiller is just a plastic vessel that has a hot or cold coil in it that adds to or subtracts from the solution as it goes by. So so our new uh, residential tanks all have a protective device. And so you set your bottom and you set your top. And so it might be, you might like to go in a cold plunge at 40 and it's set at 34. So you've got 34 to 40, and if it gets too close, on comes the heater, and it protects themselves against freezing because the football players look at you and go, it broke. <laughs> like, <laughs> what did we talk about? You said you were putting it in your basement. It was never going to go below me. I know. And when I had to put it outside because my wife didn't want to lose her sewing area or something like that. <laughs> that doesn't make it okay. And so, so – so, yeah, for, so anything that goes to a person's house is going to have just a a protective device where it heats itself to defend itself against the freezing. And then the commercial ones, because you know that you're not very insulated when you're in water, heat can escape your body at a astronomical rate. And so the biggest problem technologically with a cold plunge is getting the heat out 
that was left by the previous floater or, or guy that was bather, we'll call him, and then get it back to the, the usable temperature. And so that can be done very quickly by a commercial chiller, but the heater isn't in that system because the, the heat exchanger will be measurably larger to where it almost won't fit underneath the tank. That's why you see these guys with the afterthought ones that they put everything off to the side and they go, oh, yeah, don't pay attention to that. You're like, But it can't meet UL specifications if all that junk is out in the weather. If it's you're pouring down rain and your hand can touch a metal thing, you probably aren't going to get your rating. So the UL listing of products um, is done in four different places in the United States, in Santa Clara, California, up in uh, uh, Chicago area, and then in North Carolina. And then there's another place, I think in Texas. And so products are sent there. You're better off sending products like ours to Santa Clara because they're used to seeing hot tubs because 1563 is the same code for hot tubs uh, to be safe as it is for cold plunges. And so, so you have to be electrically certified to not get your butt suit off when you tell me do something stupid. <laughs> well, I didn't think about it being outside because it's it, it, all this stuff starts to add up where you probably have to start putting stuff outside. And up here, yeah, it was just negative 20 a few weeks ago. <laughs> so, well, yeah, but see, you're a thinking individual. It's where you live without with being off grid, if you don't think, you die. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so, so people that live in the city, they think that it's someone else's fault if they almost die. So, so we have a totally different mindset people like that. So we have to protect themselves, protect them against themselves. Yeah. I want to ask you about hot tubs too. I mean, uh, yeah, like spas. Are there things to look for? for uh, like, are they all the same as far as you're concerned? Like if, if someone goes to a hot tub store and they just want to, Pick one up. Are, are there specific There's, things to look for? Or when you're, when you're an engineer, you look at stuff. In 1995, I walked up to my business partner. I said, you know, we're trying to be 50 bucks cheaper than a bunch of people that don't know what it costs to be in business and are building a product that's built wrong. I said, I think we should really do it right. And he says, are you sure you can sell that? Because they're used to going down the street and then coming to our place and seeing if we can sell it to them for five bucks cheaper. I said, I it would only cost us about $175 more to do it right. And the energy efficiency, the reduction in maintenance and the overall design would be so significantly better that anybody that saves 175 bucks and loses everything else is an idiot that we don't want as a customer. Anyway. Have you heard about ID 10T certification? It's a lot of those out there. If you write ID 10T on the wall, it spells the word idiot. And so when, so, when you, when you see an influencer that doesn't know what he's talking about, those are ID 10 T certified individuals. So you never think of it. That's just, it's military specification, but, uh, <laughs> but I digress. Okay. So back to the hot tub theory. When you look at a normal hot tub, it is a bowl of warm water. And the thing that's wackiest about them is that they all suck except for mine. And the reason I say that is that when you look at the filter that's on the side of that tank, it's a proprietary filter that you can only buy from them. And the pump sucks through that filter, goes through the heater, then back out into the tank. Well, you know that a pump is called a pump because it's designed to push water. It's never been called a sucker, so it's not designed to suck. And so everyone in the hot tub industry sucks through their filter, knowing that as soon as the filter gets a little bit of dirt into it, you cannot pump water that you can't get. So by restricting the rate of flow to the filter or to the pump, you drop the performance of that tank in half in two weeks. So now the person only makes you money after the fact if he's buying filters from you and chemicals from you and maintenance stuff and changing his water and changing and breaking the tank in a lot of cases because he took the water out last night and dropped the nine below zero. He froze everything. Now he's got to have a whole new hot tub because he blew the thing in pieces. So, so the concept of just saying we need to circulate the water and not put much energy into it. Because during the summer, you'll notice that all the hot tubs turn off for all but eight hours a day during the summer. Because if they circulate the water during the heat of the summer, the tank ends up 110 degrees tonight. You can't use it because it's too hot. So we used to put a tennis ball underneath the cover to vent that heat just to dump it. And I thought, well, that's stupid. It looks like we're all morons. So, so the... So basically, by putting a, a motor underneath there just to circulate and purify the water, that motor draws 64 watts of power. 
So if you've got 64 watts of power instead of 640 watts, you go to $4.75 worth of electricity instead of $67 a month in electricity. So now between the cost of the electricity and the amount of chemicals you have to do because the tub's off for 16 hours a day dormant, that'll save you thousands over a decade. And then the filters from this guy, my filters are $16.50 a year. A normal hot tub uses $132 in filters a year. So if you look at that difference, I can show you just with math that a hot tub that sucks that pushes through the filter that is non-computerized that uses the proper size filter will be twelve thousand dollars less expensive to own per decade so when you start looking at like that and if you have a motor that is a non-energy efficient motor it makes tons of noise so your kid finally gets to sleep you and the wife sneak out there to get in the hot tub you turn on the pump it wakes the kid up they come down and go what are you doing and so (laughs) That gets all. That gets all. You had two minutes. And the kid woke back up and said, what are you doing? So by using ultra-quiet motors that don't vibrate at the natural frequency of the wood decks, because people don't even think about physics. You take a, a hot tub with a motor that goes, mm, and you put it on a deck that is natural. The natural frequency of that wood is 1,728, which is the low speed of that motor. The deck goes, Wah, and that deck is bolted to your house, and your house is made out of, Wood. Wood, and right. now the, now at three o'clock in the morning, when that motor decides to cycle on to keep the tank from freezing and turn the heater on, the whole back of your house goes, Whoa. <laughs> and well, why did it do that? Our motor must have come on in high speed. No, it didn't. It came on at the natural frequency of the wood that your house is made out of. And the tub is sitting on bolt, wood that's bolted to it. Never so thought about that. Wow. My, my base, vibrational transfer has never been something that anybody thought about. Till now, A, I can make this thing quieter in your refrigerator, tens of thousands of dollars cheaper over the life of the tub, and wow. half an hour of maintenance is a lot better than what they tell you. A normal hot tub is 15 minutes a week. Some of your viewers may know that in certain parts of the country, there are 52 weeks in the year. And if you take 52 weeks times 15 minutes of maintenance a week, that's 13.1 hours. So if you did 13.1 hours of maintenance on your car, you'd throw your car away. So why would you agree to do that on a hot tub that is far less important to your life than your car? You not included, I know. But at the dance, a lot of us have to get to work. Yeah. (laughs) Did you say 64 watts of power for the pump? Did I hear that right? 64 watts. It's called an electronic commutating motor. It takes any voltage that you give to it. You can give 100 if you're in Japan. You can give 230 if you're in Europe. You can give 240 if you're in the United States. And it commutes that electricity from alternating current to direct current at 12 volts DC. And it runs the motor at such a low amount of draw that it can circulate the tank indefinitely for 64 watts of power, which in most municipalities transfers into about $4.78 a month running day in, day night, and day in and day in night. So you're looking at ozonating your water, purifying the water itself, never having to open the cover and put chemicals in. Wow. But that's so, but that's not including heater and pumps, right? Like the, the jets. No, that's not the, that's not the blower. That's not the primary mm-hmm. circulator motor, but recognize that the primary expense of having a hot tub is not the heater. It uh-huh. is the circulator motor. The circulator motor draws 50 times more electricity than the heater ever does. Wow. See, people don't know that because the energy that's put in by the pump is capable of keeping it warm and the heater doesn't come on nearly as much just because of that frictional situation that we talked out about at the beginning of the video. Especially if you add some magnesium sulfate, maybe, right? Well, that's the thing. It would increase the depth of the energy that's held by the solution. That's pretty cool. Um, wow. Uh, do you want to do some rapid fire questions that listeners sent in? Oh, sure. Let's do that. Uh, yeah, I think we covered a lot unless you have another. <laughs> um, well, we quick answer them too, because maybe yeah. they anything. Yeah. Floating. So two floating and pregnancy questions. Why is floating pregnant so unbearable? Oh, and just two, yeah, floating during pregnancy. So thoughts okay. on that. <laughs> the whole concept of pregnancy and, and hot tubs or float tanks or anything else. In the first trimester, 
they don't know what it does. So they tell you to stay out. In the second trimester, they know it doesn't hurt you unless you exceed 104 degrees because then you're poaching the kid. And so it just, it causes some of the stuff that's in your bloodstream to get loose. And they don't want that to, to kind of cross the placenta wall, which it probably couldn't anyway. But the third trimester, they know that it relaxes the woman so much that baby might come early. And so that's the thing there. If she's having back pain when she's floating in a float tank, it's only because her pelvic floor has, is really tired and it's letting her back contort into some issue that nobody else has. And we don't hear many, very many people having pain in pregnancy when they're floating in a float tank because it's supposed to distribute her weight just flawlessly across your body. So she's got something that's kinked when she's walking around that she's ignoring. And then when she floats, she has time to pay attention to it. So I think that's why she thinks it's hurting when she's floating. She's ignoring it, but she's not floating. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, kind of on the same idea, but switching to cold plunges. Um, cold plunging for fertility. I know it's a stress, right? I mean, there's heat and cold stress, right? On different sides right. of the spectrum. But... Well, you'd be amazed at how many people ask me if letting their grandson into their into their hot tub will eliminate his ability to make her grandchildren. And so... You know, boys are designed in a certain way so that they can keep their, their 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 stuff cooler than their body temperature is. And so you want to talk, we've all joked, you know, as men, that if we got in a cold plunge, that they would leap to someplace north of your navel trying to get away. And so there is a comedic side to that. But we know that if you exceed 100 degrees on a boy, that his virility will go away for two weeks. And so on the hot side, there's a problem. On the cold side, there's just the, the shock factor that a lot of people are able to work through. And, and as I'm meeting more and more people, they're able to get into a cold plunge on a daily basis or a weekly basis without their eyeballs blowing out. And so I have not gotten to that point yet. <laughs> You know, you go to the Mineral Springs in Colorado, and it's 106, then 100, and then 78, and then 34. And people in the 34 are going, get in here. I'm like, no. <laughs> so I, I cannot profess to be the best uh, the best cold plunge salesman because I'm like, okay, that's what you like. <laughs> Coast Guard is flying over. Oh, <laughs> That's all right. It sounds pretty faint, but <laughs> uh, this is a good one. The magnesium in the float tanks trash my hair, even with the swim cap on. Any suggestions? Well, the when you talk about if she was using magnesium chloride, because a lot of the float tanks are flipping to that, there would be a substantial drying to that. The sulfates that are blamed for breaking down people's hair dyes in the Epsom salt version of it. So there, if your hair dye falls off and you're and you turn the tank purple then the owner of the float center wants you dead but uh but you know, when, when you talk about the magnesium and brilling her hair i think that whatever whatever um, types of conditioners that she's using is being stripped out by the magnesium because the magnesium could just lift it right off the hair mm -hmm. that's a good point about the chloride yeah yeah so she yeah. if they're mixing their metaphors then this chloride would be I think some centers, are they using both or would it be one or the other? Well, as you get closer to the East Coast, there's more magnesium chloride because they have a guy over there that's beating that drum. And then as you go to the West Coast, they're more traditionalist. And, and boy, they, they'll they just tear you apart as you get close to the West Coast because you put a light in a sensory deprivation tank. What is the matter with you? They don't need a light in sensory deprivation. You're like, no, no, no. I have to be able to convey a safe, float environment so they need the light to see where the bottom is these people don't own this tank these people are in the tank but you put a stereo in there too i'm like i don't know the <laughs> stereo is in there because you got to say hey i know you've never done this before you're terrified to do this there's a light and there's a stereo in there and you can float around and you can do gymnastics and you can shoot yourself over one end and hit the other one and shoot yourself back it's really fun okay i'll do that as long, as long as you're not closing me in and making it where there's no air. And so, <laughs> because that's the other thing. You know, people say, is there enough air in a float tank to sustain me? 
Well, there is a gap all the way around the doors of these things that lets air in. Because when I first floated, I was wearing an oximeter and I, and I was had a device that was checking my poles. And I had people sitting outside the tank reading magazines while I did it. Because it is absolutely factual that if you suffocate your customer, it has a negative impact on the performance of your, of your company. And so, so now I'm having to prove to the national entities how you can get five turns of the air in the hour that people float. And so I was demonstrating the temperature differential between the room. We're assuming the room is between 80 and 85. The tank is 94 degrees. So now you're at least 15, more more like between 10 and 15 degrees of difference in temperature. So that's called a convective transfer of air, meaning that the cold air has to come in. There's a little hole in the top of my tank that lets the air go out to the top. That creates a, a convective vacuum, which sucks fresh air in. And so I had to get this little teeny measuring device that you hold against the cracks. And then I had to use card stock and a micrometer to measure the width of the crack all the way around the door. And then I gave them calculations to prove that I had more than five turns of air in the tank per hour, which exceeds every American requirement. See, the in North American standards guys are all trying to make the Canadians happy. So the Canadians will only let you have 1,500 parts per million of carbon dioxide in that room behind me, whereas the Americans will let you have 2,500 parts per million because Americans are into candles and into all different types of things that have a flame with them. And so we allow 2,500 parts per million. Now, keep in mind, for those of you that think that a, a carbon dioxide particle is something to be horrified by, if you run out of carbon dioxide, you die. Yeah. And <laughs> so because yeah. when you get to we're right now at 0.04 percent carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at 0.02, all the trees die and there isn't enough carbon dioxide to sustain photosynthesis. So it's not as yeah. bad as I tell you on the national news. Yeah. Yeah. You can't use oxygen up, without it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the guys on submarines that are protecting our freedom right now, those guys are living at 80,000 parts per million, because when wow. you're half a mile below the surface of the ocean, you do not want to fire. You can't, right. you can't come up. Everyone can't jump out. Doesn't work like that. So at 80,000 parts per million, a Bic lighter will not stay lit. And so it can't, they can't have a fire at that high carbon dioxide levels. But those guys can do 300 pushups when they come up and get to go on shore. So they can bow <laughs> their neighbors. By, if they're wow. Super- and they don't do any oxygen therapy while they're, I guess, bringing oxygen tanks would negate that whole purpose. I have a feeling right? someone would be tapping you on the shoulder saying, yeah. hey, now, you're trying to kill us all. <laughs> yeah. So, so but, interesting. Uh, wow, was, I didn't know that. Huh. Yeah, because I I spent uh, some time with uh, there's a USS Indianapolis, and they sent all of their officers to Indianapolis to tour the local facilities. Wow. So I spent hours and hours with those guys, and they could only tell you so much about the technology. Yeah. But uh, they up just, here in North Idaho, there I think there's one of the deepest submarine bases in the U.S. Where, really? close to me. in Idaho. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's a really tough sail from the ocean <laughs> yeah. to Idaho. Yeah. A lot of noise. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought up the speaker and the light because I think uh, I, we just kind of jumped in. I didn't really describe, you know, like the experience, but it's nice to have. I, I like that feature that you have in, in my float tank with the stereo and the light because one, when you're done, it's just this button that I could reach out, reach out and touch. Right. It's kind of extending out and just push it, turn on my red light. And at least I could see to get in and out, you know. Right. <laughs> so. well, we make the uh, the light button stick out of the wall mm-hmm. about an yep. inch. And then the stereo or the sound button is next to it flush. So you can okay. tell without turning on the light where the music button is. Because the light is really bright after you've been in pitch darkness for <laughs> any length of time. So that's why uh, one of the things I try and teach people, they all say, oh, I'd love light therapy. I want to put multicolored lights in my flow tank. I'm like, no, you don't. And they go, well, what do you mean? I said, well, the multicolored lights have six colors. They've got green and yellow, which are two colors that I could not talk you into sitting in if I gave you a solution of green or yellow water because you'd interpret it as being unhealthy. So that blows out two of the six colors. Then white is all the LEDs on at the same time. That's how you get white is by adding every color together. Well, that's way too bright after you've been in the dark brain like this. Okay, so you blow out white, green. Now you've got red, purple, and blue. Red inspires aggression. There is red light therapy, but I don't 
delved into that and you don't know what frequency that has to be in order to give you what you want. And then there's purple. Both of those are cute given the right set of circumstances, but blue confuses the rods and the cones in a person's mm-hmm. eyeball. By confusing the rods and cones in a person's eyeball, the room looks 20 feet high. It looks 20 foot wide and 20 wow. foot long. You can't be afraid of a room that's that huge. Claustrophobia yeah. gets inspired by the wow. feeling of everything crushing in on you. So the blue light's the only color that makes any sense. It's standard on our tanks. And I fight you before I let you put the multicolored light on. There's still people putting it on because I'm not going to not take the money. <laughs> I love the purple one. It's just, I think it looks the coolest. Yeah. Well, the purple <laughs> is is a very, it's a you know an, an interesting chartreuse and it's calming, but it does not extinguish the claustrophobic effect. So the claustrophobic effect needs to have the air quality. It needs to have your perception that the room is large and it needs to not have the echolocation because you can hear your own hands when you talk like this. So humans have certainly good echolocation capacity. So when they hear their own breath coming back off the wall that is inches away from them, they don't feel like there's enough room there. Yeah. What? That's what parabolically designed above you on a float pod to make the the sound comes back about eight inches above your face and collides here. So we try and extinguish the audio inside of a tank with parabolic diffusion. Mm-hmm. And people don't know what that is, but that's what it means. <laughs> it <crashes laughs> each other over here. So you don't hear. Any thoughts on the the dripping from the pods? Because that's one thing that I noticed. And and the main selling point why I switched to the pool was to try to eliminate like the condensation drips. Any yeah, but keep in mind, just wax. You just take regular car wax and wax the surface oh, really? of the thing. And wow. it will change the surface tension on the tank and it will just wow. run right down the inside. Oh, that's cool. Wow, I didn't know that. People don't okay. think about it. It's dust particles from the manufacturing that electrostatically glue themselves to the inside of the tank that form the drop and fall on you. So all you gotta wow. do is Clean and wax this from the tank, and you're golden. <laughs> Every float I've ever done, it always drips. I, I mean, I wish I would have done that. That's pretty well, cool. Well, it's not your job. It's somebody else's job. Right. Like they, were, they were missing the whole point. But yeah, that's, that's part of the tower. Because when we put the heaters in the ceiling above a normal float space, even though the ceiling can be at a normal temperature that would normally convect and drip, because that 750 watt heaters on the ceiling, it can't. So the surface of the ceiling is 85 or 90 degrees, which will not allow any condensation on the ceiling. Oh, cool. We have a few more questions, Bob. Uh, okay. when, when's the ideal time to float to see the benefits? Well, that's the thing. There's a lot of opinions about that because the massage industry has been looking at that like crazy because some people don't know if you should float before massage or after the massage. And conventional wisdom is after the massage. And then there are people that find that the conversion of the cholesterol into cholesterol sulfate makes them feel like super awake. And so very seldom does a person feel like they can go to bed after they float. So the morning would make it more appropriate for you to be super powered for the remainder of the day than to float at 10 o'clock at night and go, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> so, Go on an all nighter. <laughs> right. You do that during exams in college. You go, okay, I got to pull an all nighter. You have your iPad glued to the ceiling. It's the NFL teams put an iPad on the ceiling and watch game film for their next team oh, while funny. they're floating in the pot. Well, um, kind of on the same uh, vein, is there a length of time uh, in the tank when there is diminishing returns, like what is the target float time? Well, we were exploring that from the standpoint of can a person get too much magnesium to where it's unhealthy for them? And so we've explored that. In fact, we have a, a test pilot that floats 40 hours a week. And so and he's funny to talk to, but he's, he's a regular guy and he just floats 40 hours a week and he has not ex- been and any hyper magnesium type of experiences where he's growing a new arm or something like that. And uh, so there hasn't been any, any of that being too much. And then because there's no fungals, there's no uh, situations where tissue can break down because your hands do not get pruny in a float tank. Did you notice? Yeah. Oh yeah. So there isn't a hypersaturation of your tissues. Yeah. Because- I think my limit was two hours is my longest float I ever did. Right, because the thing I tell people is that the tank is is dissolving into you. You can't dissolve into it. It is like 
it's like, like putting a sucker into a hot tub, the sucker dissolves. If you put the sucker into a float tank, that sucker flows. It does not dissolve. So that's based on density. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Um, I forgot to ask you, uh, are you familiar with Timothy Leary and the LSD dolphin floating thing? Oh, <laughs> He's yeah. doing that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, but that's where people thought that because the dolphin's brain was as large as ours were, um, that it was a practical decision to say that they're as smart as we are. And yeah. it's been completely disproven. And the only reason they thought that they were talking to him and that they were as smart as he was because they were both stuff. <laughs> he was doing <laughs> drugs with them. And so... Um, <laughs> Don't spend much time on that side. Of yeah. <laughs> Although I met a guy at the float conference that is trying to teach people how to do psychedelics like mushrooms before they float. And I go, yeah. you just don't see that because yeah. it's my luck that I get a phone call that something needs to be picked up at grade school <laughs> right after I would go into the float. Tank, you know, And without having taken a psychedelic, I can get up, dry off and go, <laughs> come back, get back in the tank. You're on a psychedelic. You're dodging the dragons and the, and the <laughs> polar bears and the fire explosions. You're in there. It feels like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Live a lifetime. In there. <laughs> trying to catch that one bug. <laughs> I mean, what's interesting, I, without uh, taking a mind altering substance, I have totally had um, seen colors, heard sounds. I mean, it's crazy what your brain can do when you do shut out sound and light. And like you said, you can't tell the difference where your body ends, you know. But that's biochemical excitation of nutrients that were already in there. They just weren't freed up because they were stuck in the mud. You just turn the mud into nutritional compost. I mean, yeah. you're you're totally off grid when you got flo- when you got magnesium in you. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you can take advantage of all the earth has to to give you. Well, like I said, it's one of my favorite therapies, and um, I mean, I f- I felt it was a reset from just the stress of you know, living, uh, you know, I think I started floating when I was 30, 36 currently, but I felt like it was a total reset of my life. So even if someone doesn't invest in a home unit, I think, um, finding one of your units at a, at a spa to float in is, is a game changer and just do, uh, just do a round right for a month or two, or you'll have people that go, well, I did float once and I didn't get anything. <laughs> it, you must be the guy that takes one pill when he's sick and says, yep, I'm still sick. You know, there's, there's a there's a lifestyle that's involved here where you have to mm. accept that it's going to be valuable to you and you have to teach your brain because I tried to do a pull up about a year ago and I am 61 years old and I, I had my brain's going, I don't think we want to do this. So I stood on a bucket and went like this and I said, this is what we're trying to do. Oh, yeah, we do that now. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to teach your brain how to benefit from a therapy like this, even a hot tub. You know, do you get instant relief from a hot tub? You do if it's three o'clock in the morning, your sci- sciatic nerve is on fire. But but under normal circumstances, you got to let yourself relax. Right. Well, chill. <laughs> I love it. Well, this was so much fun, Bob. Uh, I appreciate your uh, your enthusiasm that's con- contagious when you talk about this uh, subject. And royalspa.com, is that where people can check out your- Royalspa.com can find me there. I've got my own YouTube channel at Royal Spa. You just type that in. There's an oval Royal Spa logo. It looks like mm-hmm. And uh And uh, that particular um, logo is uh, adjacent to 99 videos on hot tubs and all kinds of different ways of getting into the business because the enthusiasm that you perceive from me is based on business. If you don't have enough enthusiasm to carry a, an idea from a thought to a conclusion, then you should not get into business. And so the, all the people that go out of business seldom die because of the environment. They died because they quit. So stick with it and you'll be a winner. Step in front of the bus of success. <laughs> I love it. Leave with some entrepreneurial wisdom. Yeah. yeah you, know, you, just have to, you have to just be thrilled to be there and everybody else will want to run with you. I love it. Well, awesome, Bob. Uh, this was so much fun. Stick around as we close out the show. Well, Bob is a blast to talk to. Love how excited he is about what he does. Hope you guys are excited to try sensory deprivation floating if you haven't. Or at the very least, maybe it made you question your beliefs around magnesium chloride versus magnesium sulfate. 
sulfation is a really important pathway for the metabolism of hormones, neurotransmitters, bile acids, a bunch of stuff. So just taking more baths in magnesium sulfate can be really beneficial. If you want to check out Bob's products, head over to royalspa.com. You can check out his hot tubs, cold plunges, float tanks, a lot of cool stuff. I had unknowingly purchased a float tank from him through another company. You can call it a middleman that marked it up significantly to a really insane degree. And then my friend Mitch that had a bad experience with that same company I purchased from told me that he found their source, which was Royal Spa. And this guy definitely seems to care about his customers and prices his products affordably. So if you ever want to make the leap and get your own float pod or even float pool, which is cheaper than the float pod, not when I purchased it, but on the Royal Spa website, it's significantly cheaper to get a pool. You just have to build a room around it. Highly recommend only buying from Royal Spa. The quality is great. The customer service seems to be really great. And Bob definitely knows his stuff. Little side note, I won't name the company by name, but I'd actually purchased a whole float pod and it was never delivered and never refunded. So that was a big reason why I wanted to have the show. If I ever discover that a company that I was promoting is not good and doesn't care about customers, then I'm definitely going to reveal that and recommend an alternative like I did in this show. My website is matt-blackburn.com. You can read about my CLF protocol. I have all of my recommended products up there that I've used over the years or are using now. My brand is called Mitolife. You can find that at mitolife.co. We have a bunch of different products, grounding sheets, really awesome shampoo and conditioner, the best seven-stage undercounter drinking water filter on the market, various supplements, different minerals, jellyfish collagen, elk velvet antler, a few of the things that makes Mitolife unique from all the other supplement companies out there. I'm slowly transitioning the entire line over to biodegradable bottles that actually break down when exposed to a landfill over a couple of years. Like it won't break down in your cabinet, but once it hits UV light and bacteria and it's in a landfill just sitting there, it won't take thousands and thousands of years to break down into microplastics, it actually releases no microplastics. And I often feel guilty taking so many supplements, not because I'm popping a bunch of pills, but because a lot of those bottles are ending up in landfills. So I'm doing my part with Mitolife to use bio bottles. And whenever you see that little BB logo on the back of, for example, lithium or encephalon or melatonin and a bunch of other products, those will break down. So that makes me feel good to contribute like that. It's more expensive. A lot of people probably don't care, but I care. And so I'm slowly switching everything over. The other thing that makes Mitolife unique is we don't use plain old silica or silicon dioxide or magnesium stearate you know, when you flip a supplement bottle over, you see other ingredients. Ours, we use bamboo extract, which is a natural source of silica. And for me, it's been kind of annoying because I have to get haircuts more often because my hair and nails are growing faster. And silica is also essential for healthy skin. So silica is awesome. It can displace aluminum in the body and everyone has tons of aluminum. I grew up drinking out of aluminum cans with phosphoric acid, reacting with the aluminum can, putting aluminum into solution and just slugging back sodas the first 20 years of my life. Definitely have some aluminum to kick out and I'm a huge fan of silica for that. That's the reason why I include bamboo silica in there. To me, 
I react a lot better to that than just plain old silica. Check out the Mito Life Academy on YouTube. It's $15 a month. You get two private videos every month and then a live Q&A the last day of every month where you can ask me anything. If you're on Instagram, that's where I share and Mito Life shares a lot of information. So I'm Matt Blackburn on Instagram and Mito Life on Instagram to keep up to date if you're waiting for products to come back in stock or to get an early sneak peek on what's coming up. So that's it. I'll see you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged.